Good morning, everyone. Welcome uh, to our online service at the Westside Church of Christ, which normally meets at 2255 Totten Road. We hope that uh, the loss of hour has not caught you, uh, uh, caused you too much difficulty this week, but we're glad that you have chosen to spend a few minutes of your week uh, beginning with worship with us. We're in our last set lesson of the series, When I've Broken My Chains, where we looked at the man possessed by many demons in Luke chapter 8. And how we relate that to our own story, you know, like that that we, we have chains and, and we have struggles and we have, have moral struggles, right? Where there's sin that seems to always want to uh, hold us down and how do we break free? How do we become free? And how does Jesus play a part in that? So anyways, we're in our last lesson this week and uh, glad that you have chosen to be with us. We're going to play a few songs. You can feel free to sing along and uh, allow them to guide your worship this morning. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, seeking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, from the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Love lifted even me, love lifted even me, when nothing else could help, love lifted me. Blessed presence live, ever his praises sing. Love so mighty and so true, merits my soul's best songs. Faithful, loving service to, to him belongs. Love lifted even me, love lifted even me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. completely saves. He will lift you by his love out of the angry waves. He's the master of the sea, billows his will obey. He, your Savior, wants to be, be saved today. Love lifted even me, love lifted even me, when nothing else could help. Love lifted me. Where the 
those uh, some older hymns that we're uh, quite fond of isn't it uh, the old rugged cross I will ever be true I'm going to begin this morning reading from John chapter 21 it's the last chapter of the four gospels it's uh, the resurrected Jesus has made some appearances already in the gospel of John and this is a, a time that he spends with Peter and the disciple whom he loved, which we often refer to as John himself. And so beginning in verse 15, I'm going to begin reading in chapter 21. It says, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show, but what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them, the one who had been reclining at table close to him and had said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? 
When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? And Jesus said to him, If it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. So the saying spread abroad among the brothers that this disciple was not to die, yet Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die, but if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? Before we began this series on Valentine's Day week, I preached on the redemptive quality of love, and I don't know if you happen to see it or not, but love to be love is redemptive. And we talked about a biblical character by the name of Gomer. And Gomer in the Old Testament is a prostitute who is taken by Hosea the prophet to be his wife. And she ends up bearing three children with Hosea, but she goes back to sexual sin. And Hosea is commanded by God to go and love her again, that love redeems her. And I want to ask you just in that brief synopsis, From Gomer's perspective, if she had ever thought, could I be something different than I am? One of the most challenging exercises I have engaged in over the past nine years is to ride in the passenger seat as one of my children are driving and not say a word about their driving, not give them any advice, not tell them what they should be doing different. I find it so difficult to not tell them what they should be doing differently or how they're supposed to be doing their job. Thinking about that, here's a puzzle I want you to solve. In every month in the United States of America, 87% of all drivers admit to engaging in what kind of behavior? 87% of all drivers every month admit to engaging in what kind of behavior? How many people today believe they know what other people should be doing? Whether it's talking about servers at a restaurant, airline clerks, fast food cashiers, police officers, politicians, even we get into more personal things, parents of other children, right, and so on, that that we people believe they know what other people should be doing. They may not have actually ever done any of these positions, and they definitely do not know what is happening in each of those people's lives at the very moment, but still there is the belief that they absolutely know what these other people should be doing. 87% of all drivers in the United States of America admit to engaging in unsafe behavior behind the wheel every month. And that could be anything. It could be, it could be speeding, it could be going through stop signs, uh, being distracted while you're driving and so on. But 87%, and the truth is if, that, if, if 80% admit to it, the actual number might be quite higher. I know I have never intended to be unsafe behind the wheel. That was never my intention. But the truth of the matter is, I have been. And I've got some real doozies of stories about how unsafe I've been behind the wheel at times. So why then do I feel the urge to tell my children about their driving, that their driving is unsafe? Why can I tell them so easily what they should be doing when I myself every month Engage in some practice that is unsafe. In our reading of John 21, you have Jesus with Peter and the disciple whom Jesus loved. And from what is recorded, Peter and Jesus have an intimate conversation to start things off. Jesus asked Peter, who is the apostle who denied him three times, if he loves him. Peter 
assures Jesus of his love, and Jesus then assigns to Peter the ministry of being kind of an under-shepherd and to feed the lambs of Jesus, that Peter is going to carry on the work of Jesus that Jesus began as the good shepherd. If you love me, Peter, feed my sheep. And Jesus ends this assignment with the command, which are common enough words, He says in verse 19 to Peter, he says, follow me. Peter, keep your eyes on me. Focus on me. Peter wants to know about the other guy. He doesn't keep his eyes focused on Jesus. And he sees the other guy that's following. And he says to Jesus, well, what about this guy? And Jesus' response is very clear. What I want for him is for him. What is that to you? It's a great line, isn't it? Peter, you follow me, Jesus says. And whatever I want John to do, I will tell John. And that's going to be between John and me. What is that to you? And you know, when we talk about the ability to tell other people, there are so many factors in life. And even in this chapter, we notice that in this chapter, Peter's death was a factor and John's non-death was a factor. There are so many different factors in life that it really is not an easy exercise after all. As we've been going through this series, we know some things about sin. We know, first of all, that all of us have been through or go through struggles with sin. The Hebrew writer says that there is a sin that easily besets us. There's a sin that clings so closely. And so either we know what it's like to go through it or we're going through it. That there's this challenge in our life and we keep on fighting this struggle. And the second thing we know is that some struggles should not really be highlighted over others, but empathized with. Why is it that it's so easy for me to tell you every way that someone else might be driving that's unsafe, but I don't really think about my own driving that's unsafe? Some struggles don't deserve to be highlighted over others, but empathized with. When we talk about other people's struggles, why are their struggles more worthy of recognition than anyone else's? This is the difference sometimes between being critical and being redemptive with our love. Where we're seeking redemption, instead of winning against someone, we want to win that person. There's a difference. In the eighth chapter of John, it's an interesting connection in the entire chapter. In John 8, 46, Jesus asked the challenging crowd, which of you convicts me of sin? That's a big challenge, right? Like, you, People don't like the way Jesus is acting. People think that Jesus should be acting differently. But which one of you really convicts me of sin? Then you have At the beginning of chapter of John chapter 8, you have the story of the woman taken in adultery, remember? And and the people bring up the law and they say, the law commands us to stone her. What do you say? And, And Jesus, of course, makes that famous statement, right? Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And the people, of course, leave because they realize now that they all, they all, are familiar with the practice of sin. And so Jesus then says to her in verse 10, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus says, Neither do I condemn you. Go and from now on sin no more. It's interesting, Jesus doesn't even ask her to make a a public confession here. And right in the middle of those two stories, you've got the conversation Jesus is having with the Jews who believed in him. Remember, he says, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. But he says in verse 34, because they have a problem with that idea 
they think they're, they've always been free. And so Jesus says in verse 34, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Anyone who commits sin is the slave to sin. There's a, a power in sin. And all of us can relate to that, that there's a struggle to break free. But Jesus then says, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. So back to our original story of Luke chapter 8. I want to read verses 34 through 39. And we're going to end the, the series this week. And notice the demon-possessed man. Remember we talked about last week that the demon was not part of his identity and the pronoun change and so on, that the demon was separated from the man and the man was different. He wasn't the demon-possessed man. So in verse 34, it says, When the herdsmen saw what had happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. Then people went out to see what had happened. And they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it told them how the demon-possessed man had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And he went away, proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. Now, I want you to remember the position of the man, and I want you, if you can, to try to compare him with Gomer, who I mentioned earlier, and with that question, if Gomer ever thought, could I be something different? Could I become something different than what I am? Big question, isn't it? In, in the earlier part of the story, in verse 27 of chapter 8, the, the man, we're told, had demons, and he wore no clothes, and he didn't live in a house, and he lived among the tombs. And then in verse 29, it says the demons ha would seize him often, and he was kept under guard. He was bound with chains and shackles, and when he would break them with unbelievable strength, he would be driven into the desert. This was what the guy was like, chained by a fearful community or free in utter loneliness. And now we see this, the, the position of the man quite differently. By the end of chapter 8, the man is sitting at the feet of Jesus. This is the same description, remember, uh, in a couple of chapters late, later in chapter 10, and when Jesus has dinner or supper at Mary and Martha's house, and Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus, and Martha's very upset about that. It's similar to the Apostle Paul when he talked about being trained in, in Jerusalem at the feet of Gamaliel. This guy is now sitting at the feet of Jesus. What a position to be in now. He's sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. What's the difference with him? Well, the main difference is Jesus. A lot of other differences, but that's the main difference. Or that's the, the, the cause of the differences we see in the effect. And like Gomer, could he have thought this was going to be his future? Did he ever believe, even a week earlier, did he ever believe he could actually become something different? That's sometimes what happens to us in our struggles, and our struggles of, of sin, isn't it? We, we just... We're tired of it, but could, could we imagine being something different? It's difficult. But as I said last week, as Christians, we know our future. We know that we're going to go from today to our future, right? We know that we're going to be fully well, fully whole, fully healed, fully clean, fully righteous. We know that's what our future is going to be. And, and as I said last week, the things that we are not bringing with us into our future are therefore not essential to who we are. The 
The New Testament has a word it calls sanctification, where we are being made holy, where our practice will meet up with our position, which is justification, right? When we come to Jesus and he washes us clean, we, we are justified. We, our position is, 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 is justification. Our position is saved and, and a child of God and blameless. Well, sanctification is the work of, of, of our practice meeting our position. And when we're fully holy, the New Testament tells us we are who we were always intended to be in Jesus' image. This is what we were intended to be. And our call is to follow him, to not let our eyes get distracted, to follow him. The one who knows us the best, loves us the most, and enables change in us. Love redeems. Love is redemptive. And so in chapter 8, we watch the entire set of stories unfold, and we see something peculiar, especially in our scene. See, in verses 19 through 21 of chapter 8, Jesus redefines the family. My mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. They hear the word of God and they do it. And then in verses 22 through 25, you have the disciples with fear. And they are in terror and they are afraid. And so Jesus says, where is your faith? And, and then in chapter 9, verses 1 through 6, you have the disciples perform remarkably well. And so in, in verse 38 and 39, this is what might be peculiar to us. Following Jesus has a lot of similarities, but also can mean greatly different things. There are different factors at work. There are so many different factors. And so Jesus can say to Peter, whatever I want to happen with John, that, what's that to you? What is that to you, really? Really? You follow me. You follow me. The man begs Jesus to go with him. And this might seem peculiar because we might expect that Jesus would say, yes, come on. Come with me. He does that with Peter, Andrew, James, and John. Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Come with me. But if the man had gone with Jesus, it also would have meant he was going to go with the disciples or the apostles. But the man is not told to do what Peter, James, and John are told to do. Jesus has other plans for this guy. Remember, the people of the city are so afraid that they ask Jesus to leave. And Jesus will do so. He doesn't impose himself on anyone. And it seems like they lose this golden opportunity. But Jesus then says to the guy, go home and tell them how much God has done for you. I don't want you to be like Peter, Andrew, James, and John. You go home and you tell everybody how much God has done for you. And so what does the guy do? Well, he hears the word of God and he does it. He doesn't do what Peter, Andrew, James, and John does, but he does what Jesus wants him to do. And he goes through the entire city and proclaims how much Jesus had done for him. I don't know if you noticed that. Jesus has proclaimed how much God has done and he goes and proclaims how much Jesus has done for him. You know, it's interesting, had he just done what Peter, Andrew, James, and John had done, these people would never have heard this story. And what a story. 
What a successful story all of us have that Jesus and his love sets me free. What a story that I was in a position and I couldn't even imagine that I could become something different. But with Jesus walking with me, reminding me of who I really am, what a story. Jesus and his love has set me free. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. You're rich in love and you're slow to anger, your name is great and your heart is kind, for all your goodness I will keep on seeing. For my heart to find To bless the Lord, oh my soul Oh my soul Worship His holy name Sing like never before Oh my soul I'll worship Your holy name strength is failing, the end draws near, and my time has come. Still my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and then forevermore. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship His holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. I'll worship your holy name. I'll worship your holy name. Hopefully, you've enjoyed. This series, um, we're going to have a, a standalone lesson next week, and then I'm going to do a another series uh, leading into the Easter season. Were you there when my Lord was resurrected? Uh, playing on the on the hymn, "Were you there when they crucified my Lord?" But were you there when my Lord was re resurrected? And we're going to look at a, a few of the known stories, but maybe not the more popular stories around the resurrection of Jesus. 
Concerning the death and resurrection of Jesus, every first day of the week we gather in churches of Christ around the Lord's table or the Lord's supper, remembering the great sacrifice that Jesus did for each and every one of us that reminds us of the reasons why our sins are forgiven, the reasons why we're called children of God, and the reasons why we're going to spend a, a glorious eternity forever with our Heavenly Father and Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 11, Paul says in verse 23, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Bow with me for uh, the bread. Father God, we are so thankful for you. We're thankful, Father, for Jesus. We're thankful for uh, this emblem of bread, which represents that body that he willingly allowed to be broken on our behalf, Father. His death was such a, a moment of suffering in the life of Jesus, and yet he did this out of his great love for you and his great love for us. Father, help us to partake in a way that honors that sacrifice. It's through Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And please bow with me for the fruit of the vine. Father God, again, we are so thankful for Jesus. We're thankful for the blood that was shed on the old rugged cross so that our sins could be forgiven forever. Bless us as we partake of this cup. It's through Christ's name we pray. Amen. I thank you so much for joining us today. If you have any questions or you have any requests so we encourage you to reach out to us any way you can you can email me at westsidewindsorcoc at gmail.com you can look us up on the web at windsorchurchofchrist.weebly.com you can also call me at 519-995-4189 and if you have any uh Thing that you would like us to be praying about if you have any questions about the bible if you have any questions about jesus or the life of following him we'd be more than happy to sit down and talk with you um, we just want to remind everyone that uh, things are moving forward and so some things may change with how we do things here we're hoping to uh, stream live from the church building and so our service might begin at 11 by then but anyways we'll let you know as it goes um, we hope everyone has a, a great week ahead. I know it's March break, and if you have kids, I hope you have a, a wonderful week ahead. Um, please bow with me for a final word of prayer. Father God, we are so thankful for you. We're thankful you watch over us. We're thankful you take care of us. Thank you so much, Father, for the people who have tuned in today. Help them uh, find blessings in this week, Father. Let them know that they are loved. It is through Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless everyone.